Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to present you a work that has done, been done with Professor Bill Gayildes on the impacts of extended defects in reducible metal oxide by computer simulation. Okay, um, let me start the presentation with some brief introduction on what is defects and why we need to use computer, computational modeling to handle the problem. And in the end, I will give you a lot, a lot of details so we can bring a story home about what is dislocations and how they affect the material in Syria. Um, so this is a nuclear reactor. So thanks, Brendan, talk about radiational damage. Um, this is our view from the atomic level. So we can see a lot of material. In real life or in the nuclear reactor, they are crystal structure. But no crystal are perfect. They always consist of a lot of defects, especially those who are key nuclear reactor. Um, here I will use uranium dioxide as an example to show you what kind of defects it will be from an atomic level. Um, so first we have zero dimension pond defects. So here uh, the larger sphere is uranium and the smaller one is oxygen. Um, so you can replace one of the host cation of the uranium into some fiction product, xenon. We call it doping cation. And the other type of defects will be you remove an oxygen and form an oxygen vacancy. Um, this is very small. Um, we can also have one dimensional defect, which is a dislocation. So it's basically a line in the crystal where the um, symmetry will break down. Um, we also have two dimensional defects, surface and green boundaries. So the later two types is what we call extended defects. Because in, one di like in certain dimension, they are very small, like a uh, cross-section of the dislocation line, they are very small. But on the other dimension, they can extend very, very long. And what we care about is how these extended defects interact with the pond defect. Um, so today, we are not going to talk about uranium dioxide. We're actually talking about cerium dioxide. So cerium dioxide has exactly the same structure as uranium dioxide. We call it fluoride. Um, it used to be a surrogate material for uranium dioxide because they have the same structure. The cation is very heavy element. People thought they were the same. So in experiment, people use it a lot to study the, quality, uh, the properties of uranium dioxide. But this day, we find out the two materials are very different. Um, so nowadays, we use it more as an electrolyte material for solid oxide fuel cell. So just a quick introduction of what is solid oxide fuel cell. So it's basically it's a device that can convert the chemical energy in fuel into electricity. So you can see the uh, schematic here. So oxygen molecule will come at this side and meet at the surface of cathode, get reduced, form oxide ion, and will transport throughout the whole device through the electrolyte and meet with the fuel at the other side of the anode surface, um, oxidize the fuel. Um, during the whole process, we can control the flow of oxygen, this oxide ion, and the flow of electron. So by this way, we can convert the chemical energy directly into electricity. So we can skip all the steps that you may need to use, like chemical energy into heat, heat into mechanical energy, and mechanical energy into electricity. We don't need that. We can directly from chemical energy to the electricity. So in principle, SOFC can have a very high energy efficiency to, to convert the fuel into electricity. Um, it's also a very flexible device. You can use multiple types of fuel. Um, more importantly, you can use it reversibly. So you can couple it with other energy source to plug in the electricity and generate fuel. So it's good to couple with nuclear reactor, wind, or solar power plant. Um, but this device has a problem. We haven't commercialized it. The problem is the device work at high temperature. And here, high temperature, I mean 900 Celsius degree, not 90 Kelvin. Um, so as you can imagine, it's just a super, super hot things in the center. And if we want to maintain the device, let it run for a long time, we need to pay a lot of price to keep the whole things work well, not degrade over a long time, right? So this is one of the main barrier, how to lower this cost to lower the operating temperature. But it turns out that lower the operating temperature is a non-trivial job. So here I show you an equation of the transition state theory. So K is the chemical reaction rate. So how fast the reaction takes place. How efficient are we to convert the um, fuel into electricity? And E is reaction barrier. So the initial energy we need to input to uh, 
initiate the interaction, and T is the temperature. So you can see here, if you want to lower the operating temperature, the K will be reduced. Um, one of the way to keep the K is to lower the E simultaneously. And this will require to change the intrinsic properties of the material. Um, so what we need to do is to optimize the material to compensate all the loss it brought by the lower operating temperature. And here for the electrolyte material for Syria, what we want to do is to keep the ionic conductivity, make the conductivity as fast as possible, even at a lower operating temperature. So people have tried a lot of methods. One of the methods is called strain engineering. So strain engineering means you can do a thin film sample. So the blue one is the substrate. They have a certain lattice parameter. And you grow the other type of material on top of the substrate, the, the orange one. So these two materials, originally, they have different lattice parameter. But because we grow it one on top of each other, you can manage to change the lattice parameter of the orange one. And therefore, you can stretch or compress the thin film. Um, by straining this sample, you can change the E, the reaction barrier for the um, uh, ionic conductivity, and therefore you can enhance it and uh, keep the efficiency of SOFC. But the problem is the results in the literature were super scattered. So by the time we started this project, um, there's eight orders of magnitude difference from different results. Like people say we get no enhancement at all in their thinking sample. And some of the people say, well, we see three orders, five orders, or eight orders of magnitude enhancement in their thinking sample. So it's very controversial. Um, but what we find out is in a lot of these samples that reported in the literature, there's not only elastic strain. So the lattice parameter is not that easy to be changed. In this sample, there's actually a lot of plastic strain, a lot of dislocations. So you can see here, it's an TM image that I get from the literature. So left-hand side is magnesium, right-hand side is stabilized stabilized zirconium. So at the interface, there's a bunch of dislocations, so um, highlighted by this small symbol at this interface. It means the elastic strain in these samples may be relaxed, and such a system of dislocation, they are of very high density, um, may change their experimental results. But the problem is, what kind of role does dislocation play in terms of ionic conductivity? People still hold different point of view, and some of the people say, well, dislocation will enhance the ionic conductivity, because ionic conductivity intrinsically is you are moving the oxygen around. And dislocation was no to be very good at moving mass, like they're a fast pipe uh, for mass transport. Um, well, the other group of people, they argue that no, dislocation is, are detrimental because if you have the dislocation, you will relax all the elastic strain in your thin, uh, thin film and therefore remove all the enhancement that brought by the strain engineering. Um, so, uh, we want to clarify whether this dislocation can enhance or uh, decrease the ionic conductivity. Just to give you a sense of scale, um, the dislocation is very hard to measure by experimentalists one at a time. So dislocation core, so this one is dislocation. The area it impacts around the dislocation is very small. Um, it's around uh, one angstrom to maybe one nano meter or 10 nanometer. So it's super helpful experiment to measure them one by one and to see how the dislocation impact the ionic conductivity. So that's why we need uh, computational modeling for this problem, because you can uh, clean all the other uh, factors that may affect your results and only look into the dislocation. Um, so here's our model. Uh, we introduced an edge dislocation at the center of a slab Syria. Um, you can also see from the atomic structure, so these part, they are perfect crystal. Looks very organized. But at the center here, the symmetry change. So it's the dislocation core. Um, this dislocation, they will bring in an asymmetry strain and stress field. Um, so for the area far away from the dislocation, they're not that affected by the dislocation. So we, uh, but they're still uniaxially strained. Um, so upper part, we call it compressive strain. So it means the material is uh, pressed a little bit. 
and lower part is called tensile strain, so the material is stretched. Um, when you get closer to the dislocation, you can see the color here is darker, means a much higher strain and stress field around the dislocation. But still, we can divide it into two parts. Uh, we call it compressive dislocation core and tensile dislocation core. Um, so in Syria, it's similar to uranium dioxide. They also have several types of defect. The first type is oxygen vacancy. So the hope of oxygen vacancy is equivalent to the move of oxide ion. So they are the um, um, decided, like, uh, main factor for the oxide ion conductivity. And this reaction takes place uh, in a very, very fast um, speed. So you can, we can simulate it by molecular dynamics. And the other type of defects is called dopant cation. So you have a trivalent dopant cation. And this one is the host, it's a serum sweet plus. So diffusion of the dopant cation is very, very slow. It may take hours or days. So it's for sure out of the time scale that we can simulate by molecular dy dynamics. Um, so that's why we need to use two different um, simulation scheme to simulate these two defects. So one is Monte Carlo to handle the dopant cation diffusion. So it's very similar to the Monte Carlo method that people use for neutron transport. So basically you have some random walk and then accept or reject these uh, walk based on the, some energy criteria. And we use molecular dynamic to handle the diffusion of anion. And after we do this um, method, Alternatively, again and again, we can end up with an equilibrium configuration of these defects. So let me show you how these defects interact with the dislocation. So you can see a concentration plot here. So the color represents a concentration of dopant cation defects around the dislocation, which is at the center. Um, first, we can see an enrichment region, so here. The concentration of dopant cation will be much higher around the dislocation in this enrichment area. And on the other side, still around the dislocation, but the concentration will get very low because of the depletion region. Um, so in this case, you can see this one is the defect, the dopant cation is much bigger than the host cation serum 4 plus. If I change the size of the defect, I can change it into a gadolinium 3 plus, it's slightly smaller, uh, ypsilon even more small, um, scandium smaller than the serum 3 plus. So you can see the enrichment region can shift from this tensile region part to the compressive region part. Um, this is a result of elastic energy minimization. So larger dopant cation will prefer to go to the tensile zone because the um, space there is larger, it's easier to accommodate this defect, while the smaller dopant cation will prefer to go to the compressive region to relax the local strain and stress. Um, how about oxygen we can see? So oxygen we can see in each case, so we have these four material. Um, the, the size of oxygen we can see are so all the same in these four cases. They are all smaller than the host cation. However, we don't see the oxygen we can see always go to the compressive field. Instead, we see the same pattern as the cation redistribution. So basically, these oxygen we can see just follow the dopant cation. Where the dopant cation go, where the oxygen we can see go. Um, this is just a um, result of the Coulomb interaction. The oxygen we can see in this material is positively charged, and the dopant cation is negatively charged. So they like to bind with each other. Um, if the cation go to the tensile region, the oxygen we can see will also um, go to the tensile region. Um, such a redistribution of defects will for sure impact the oxide ion conductivity, um, the, how the oxygen transport in the material. So here I show you an animation. All the small, like big red dots are oxygen we can see. Um, so we can see the region first here, far away from the dislocation. So the blue dots are the dopant cation. I fixed them in this calculation. Um, you can see the red dots can move around and some of them can travel very far away. So they are not that affected by the dislocation. But when you get closer to this dislocation, so first this area, um, there's not much blue dot because the depletion region. Um, so it's also very hard for the oxygen we can see to go through this area. Um, the other side, the enrichment zone, it turns out that there's too many blue dots, too many dopant cations. The oxygen we can see is just basically get trapped in this area. Um, it's also very hard for them to go through. So for the two direction, the Z direction and the X direction, the diffusivity of oxygen is slowed down. How about the direction along the dislocation line? 
So along the dislocation line, traditionally, there are known as the fast diffusion path. So in a lot of other material, aluminum oxide, magnesium, or uranium dioxide, people would say dislocation enhance the diffusion. But how about in Syria? So we find out, you know, um, the dislocation cannot enhance the diffusivity. So let's look at this plot. These two dots represent the diffusivity in the green and the yellow region. Um, the bulk reference, the case that there's no dislocation at all, is normalized to one in the dashed line. So both area has a slower diffusivity along the dislocation. And the physical reason is the defect-defect interaction here. So right-hand side is a plot from the literature. Um, the diffusivity would change with different concentration of defects. And if you are away from the optimum level to the right-hand side, means there are too many defects, they start to cluster, associate with each other, the diffusivity will be slowed down. That's what happened at this enrichment area. And if you go to the left-hand side, the defect concentration is very low, very low. What happened in this side? But basically, there's not enough oxygen vacancy to mediate the transport of oxygen. Um, so a conclusion will be, along the dislocation line, we don't see any fast diffusion, unlike in other oxide material. Um, this chain would hold for 4 to 12 percent cerium 3 plus or 4 to 12 percent gadolinium dope ceria. And the summary of this story is, dislocation, this kind of extended defect that will bring in a strain and stress field and leads to a redistribution of pond defects. And such a redistribution of pond defects will in the end kill the um, ion transport in Syria. And if people want to enhance the ion ionic conductivity of this material for solid oxide fuel cell, we will suggest them try to avoid dislocation, try to annihilate dislocation in your sample. Um, strain engineering, use elastic strain will be a much better choice. Um, so in the end, um, an analog, so some of the people say dislocation is a highway for mass transport in Syria, we only see traffic jam. Okay, um, so uh, finally acknowledge the funding agency from DOE and the computational resource from NERSC and EC. These two centers are very great. They allow us to use like the top seven computer in the world to do our calculation. And my thesis committee, Professor Yudis, Professor Lee, and Professor Cavallaro, um, most importantly, uh, Professor Yudis group. Yeah, um, I'm ready for question. my calculation, so 4 to 12 percent, because the optimum level, as you can see in the literature, is around 8 to 10 percent, yeah. So you want a very high ionic conductivity here, so that's why you need to go to very high concentration. And this is very abnormal. In other material, the dopant concentration never go this high. Well, you have several way. You can see them collectively, right? You, if you have a bulk material and you can compress them and create a lot of dislocation and you measure the sample, this is one way to do. But we know it's very hard for Syria because for Syria it's even super hard to get a single crystal material, a big enough single crystal to do this compression stuff. Um, if you want to create a dislocation at the interface, you can change different substrate. You can use magnesium oxide, which is maybe is too big, aluminum oxide, it's a fire. Yeah, and by changing the lattice parameter of your substrate, you can tune the concentration of this location. But in those experiments, you also need to deconvolute the signal from the interface effect. Right? That's why we want to use computer simulation, because there's no interface and you can still have a dislocation. I've seen zirconium dope syria for like free-range catalysis and oxygen storage materials. I'm just curious if you look at zirconium doping and whether that enhances 
Right. You mean why don't I look into zirconium dope in Syria? Or? Yeah, I'm assuming that's coming it's very common material and toxic material. Yeah, zirconium dope Syria is very commonly seen. Um, so I, I, I guess what happened would be similar, maybe less. Um, actually, the, the same words, so you know zirconium, the size of zirconium is smaller than Syria, cerium, and they will for sure redistribute around this location. We also know that zirconium, this cation would like to bind with oxygen we can see. So it's through a different mechanism. So in my study, the binding between the dopant cation to oxygen we can see is through columbic interaction. If you use zirconium, it's the same valence, right? It's four plus, cerium is also four plus. And the binding is different. So in, in that case, the zirconium bind with oxygen we can see is because zirconium would prefer a lower coordination. And it usually prefer seven, and cerium usually prefer eight, so that's why all the oxygen like to go next to the zirconium. So there's still have a lot of check jam around the dislocation. If you try to, yeah. So, so far you've been talking about crystalline materials where you have dislocations. Mm -hmm. What about amorphous materials where you don't have dislocations? Some of your ideas still work in terms of strange uh, string engineering and amorphous material. Um, I don't have too many clues. I can expect, well, um, the string can still change the energy land landscape of the amorphous material, right? Uh, the formation of different kind of defect and the interaction of different kind of defect. So you may uh, expect some kind of different properties due to the formation energy change and barrier change, but I have no clue like what kind of so, I mean, things. In terms of defect, uh, can you imagine defects in the amorphous materials, which are not dislocations, but you can have cracks, yeah. cracks or line defects. Yeah. So uh, in some sense, you, you, know, you can have fractured in crystals, but you can also have fractured in amorphous materials. Yes. So uh, there are shear transformations. There's a local transformations. They're not topologically connected. They, yeah. they don't require uh, that as